Hello and welcome to today's presentation, Moving West, the Exodusters Movement, presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum, whose mission is to honor anti-slavery abolitionists, their work to end slavery, and the legacy of that struggle, and strive to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. Before the well-known mass migration of Black Americans to the North in what would be called the Great Migration in the early to mid-1900s, many Black Americans made the decision to leave the South and head for different lands to escape violence and economic stagnation. One such mass movement was called the Exoduster Movement, originating from the word Exodus, as many compared the movement of Black Americans from the South to the escape of the Jewish people from Egypt. Those that participated in this movement were called Exodusters. So, what was the Exoduster Movement? After the era of Reconstruction, spanning from the end of the Civil War in 1865 to 1877, thousands of Black Americans migrated to Kansas and a few other Western states in search of economic and labor opportunities. One main driver was the Homestead Act. Passed in 1862 during the Civil War, the act was meant to promote the settlement and cultivation of Western territory by promising adult citizens who had not fought against the Union, or adults who intended to become citizens, 160 acres of public land. The land would be theirs after they occupied it for five years, and so long as they cultivated and improved the land. Or they could keep the land after just six months of residing on the land, and after which they would have to pay $1.25 per acre to the government. In theory, Black Americans could make use of this act, as the Civil Rights Act of 1866, the nation's first civil rights law, declared that all people born in the United States were citizens, quote, without distinction of race or color, or previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude, end quote. Additionally, the passing of the 14th Amendment in 1868 stated that, quote, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws, end quote. Therefore, Many black people, whose rights were, in fact, being violated in the South, decided to move west to seek the opportunity of land ownership. Land ownership would be a big deal for the thousands of formerly enslaved people trying to make a living in the post-Civil War South. Black codes put them at risk of being imprisoned, and they were the victims of white violence, like lynching, for the smallest indiscretions. A report published by the Equal Justice Initiative in 2015 found that in 12 southern states, 2,000 lynchings occurred from 1865 to 1876, the era of Reconstruction. Given how public lynchings were, as they were meant to terrorize the rest of the black population, it was only logical to southern black people that after Union troops left the South at the end of Reconstruction in 1877, troops that were there to enforce the emancipation and the rights of the formerly enslaved, based on the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the situation was only going to get worse. So many decided to leave. Additionally, land ownership in a state like Kansas would be a vast improvement for many Southern Blacks. Many of the formerly enslaved have been forced to work the very land that they had toiled for as enslaved people. Though their former masters now had to pay them, the pay was usually meager and the exploitation continued. They had to continue to work the same land because those that had been enslaved rarely possessed any skills or knowledge beyond what they had been tasked to do as slaves, which mainly consisted of farm work. Therefore, if they desired to survive after slavery, they had to continue working for the very same people that had exploited them because they had no money to buy their own land. Many black Americans also fell victim to sharecropping a practice by which landowners allowed farmers to work their land in exchange for a share of the crop as payment. However, this payment amounted to very little pay and drew many black farmers into debt, ensuring they'd stay working the land for a long time. So, many black southerners began to migrate to Kansas, 
which to some appeared to be some kind of promised land. Kansas, after all, had been the center stage for the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which allowed for states to determine, by popular sovereignty, if they would enter the Union as a free or slave state. It became a mythical place where the fight against slavery had begun as a series of bloody conflicts ensued as pro-slavery Southerners flooded the state alongside anti-slavery Northerners, each group trying to influence Kansas's entry into the Union as a free or slave state. These bloody conflicts would come to be known as Bloody Kansas. The abolitionist John Brown would also leave his mark in this conflict as he and a group of men, mostly from his family, enacted the Patawatomi Massacre, where they attacked and killed five pro-slavery settlers. This created a positive view of Kansas for many black Southerners seeking to leave the South. Additionally, Kansas was close enough to the South that many migrants could make it without having much money or resources. Obviously, migrants moved in different ways, and many made the journey throughout the 1870s. However, it was the 1879 migration wave that caught the attention of the public. It was also the last, as the movement would end by 1880. In total, around 6,000 black Southerners, mostly from Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas, made the journey to Kansas beginning in 1879. Among those 6,000, a few found the promised land they sought, but most continued to struggle. Even then, however, they benefited from being removed from the oppressive hands of white Southerners and therefore lived out much freer lives that enabled them to reach their true potential. Kansas's population also changed substantially. While its black population had been about 6,250 in 1870, 10 years later in 1880, it was now 43,110 black Americans living in Kansas and calling it home. 6,000 of those coming in just the year 1879. For those that remained in the South, the struggle continued. After Reconstruction, Jim Crow laws made segregation the norm in the South, a practice that would continue until the Civil Rights Movement in the 1950s and 1960s. The cause of those who stayed behind was also further harmed by the removal of so many other Black people to other states. However, their continued presence in the South meant that the struggle for democracy and equality continued, even if ever so slowly, but surely moving forward. Thank you very much for attending today's presentation. Please help us by completing a brief survey at the link on your screen and also in the video description. Your feedback will help Nahoff receive funding and help plan future projects. Additionally, please contact Nahoff with any questions or comments or if you're interested in learning more about the organization and its work. Don't forget to follow us on social media, and we hope to see you at our next presentation. Thank you.